chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in your one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted that to you, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. I will be reading from the uh, book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Therefore, my dear friends, as, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. But then you will shine among them like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you should be, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Appreciate uh, Brian and Nate reading those passages. Uh, today's lesson is going to be how to influence our world for Jesus Christ. In the passages uh, these guys just read, uh, Paul is encouraging the believers of Philippi to apply their faith in Christ to their social life. It is clear that God's mention is that believers should have an action acting influence for a good for good in society. If we avoid society by locking ourselves into a round of safe Christian activities and meetings, we cannot influence our world for God. Even though Paul was unsure of the outcome of his imprisonment and impending trial, he was concerned that whatever the outcome his friends at Philippi should continue to live for God. He exhorts them to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word which he uses is translated, conduct yourselves. It refers to our lives as citizens or members of society. It would include such areas as our attitudes at our workplaces, our honesty, our cooperativeness, our financial management, and our contribution to the well-being of society. Too often, the idea of Christian testimony or lifestyle is linked to just a few restrictions, like maybe not smoking or not drinking, but we're ignoring much larger and weightier matters. Specifically, Paul addresses the need for unity. Stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man, working together as Christians in cooperation and mutual respect is a crucial part of our witness in this world. 
bickering Christians, no matter how holy they might be in terms of dress or other externals, are the worst possible testimony to the world. I think we can all agree that that is true. So God does not want us to become, a stale, become stale in our Christian life or to slip backwards. Rather, we're told to work out our salvation. Note that we are not told to work for our salvation, but we are to work out our salvation. The salvation is a free gift of God, but it takes a lifetime of learning and laboring, making right decisions and sacrifice to mature our salvation experience. It is God's plan that we work together with Him to develop into the godly people He saved us to be, mature in thoughts and in our actions. Now he mentions fear and trembling. It reminds us of the gravity of the responsibility placed upon us. We are to have a sense of holy awe <clears throat> concerning the God whom we live for and a sense of horror concerning our sin. After all, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ <clears throat> that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body whether good or bad. <clears throat> in the midst of a society that is corrupted by sin, the life of the Christian is to provide a striking contrast compared to stars shining in the night sky. As an area of our conduct of specific concern, we are told to do everything without complaining and ar or arguing. In a society where contention, strife, Criticism, slander, and all kinds of negative attitudes are everywhere. How striking it is, it is to find someone who has a pleasant attitude and who speaks words that are edifying and gracious. Knowing that his disciples at Philippi are living this kind of transformed life, radiating the gospel from their lives and witness, Paul could rejoice that the purpose of his evangelistic ministry had been accomplished. <coughs> One of the characteristics of mature believers is their positive influence on others. Most of us have followed the example of a more mature Christian. Paul was not afraid to set himself as an example in his pattern of life for others to follow. Paul was also deeply saddened and wept as he considered those Christians whose present lifestyle made them actually enemies of the cross. The cross speaks of death to the sinful self. But here were people whose God is their stomach, whose glory is in their shame, and whose mind is set on earthly things. In other words, their priority in life was merely sensual gratification. We should take these words to heart because it is speaking there of those who had started out as Christians. Today we live in a society where we are bombarded by invitations to sensual gratification in a manner almost unimaginable in a time of the Apostle Paul. Both the Eastern and Western Hollywood varieties are hostile to developing Christian worldview and our thoughts of life. We are a different type of people. Our citizenship is in heaven. This does not mean that we are to wash our hands of the world. Rather, it means that the rules and the standards and norms by which we live are not, oh, not those of this world, but of the kingdom of God. Living a Christian life, which is an example to others, does not refer only to witnessing in the narrow sense of talking about God. Our thought life will govern our words, our decisions, and our actions. Thus we are to think about whatever is true, or right, or pure, or lovely, or admirable, or excellent, or praiseworthy. 
whether the topic is religion or politics, uh, the environment or the family, the principle is applicable. When our thoughts are pure and positive, our words and our actions will follow. How can we be a light for the gospel at home, at work, in the neighborhood, or in, in our nation? Again, our lesson this morning is about influencing our world for Christ. Today, <clears throat> the idea of our time together is to look at just some of the many ways we can make a difference as we live and work in a world that doesn't seem to have much time for Christ or Christians. But it doesn't have to remain that way. In fact, you notice in, a lot, in our country that in many ways there's a lot of good things going on. A lot of uh, improving in many places. However, there is still much work to be done. God has entrusted us the task of telling the world about Christ. It takes more than just words. And while words are important, they are not the only thing we are to use. Our lives are to reflect a relationship with Christ that affects everything we do in public and in private. The areas we are going to deal with today are just a few of the ways we can make a positive influence. I doubt you will hear anything new this morning. Much of life tends to be a reminder of lessons we, we have learned before. <clears throat> but I hope this will be some fresh encouragement to, a, to be a positive in a world of negatives. The first area of influence is holy living. We have always been taught to live holy lives, but it bears repeating. Holiness is crucial to pleasing God and influencing others for Christ. Holiness sets us apart as a people who aren't reliant on the world's value system. Allow me to read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. The idea here, friends, is that we need to live lives that are different from those who don't love Christ. If we hang on to the world's values and its lifestyles, we tell them we have nothing to live for that's any better than what they have. I think that's true. The second area of influence is how we treat those who mistreat us. Listen as I read the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? So be perfect, therefore, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. So do you see the point here? We are to treat others differently than the world does. There are two benefits to treating others well. First, there is the benefit of making a statement about the world's value system. As we mentioned already, the world wants revenge. But we grant grace and mercy. And we reflect that mercy and grace God showers on us as his children. Second, it also leaves witnessing opportunities for later. 
The third area we'll be looking at this morning is in the area of work habits. The passage I would like to look at is in Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. It's my opinion that Christians should be the most valued people on the payroll. Why? Because they should be the hardest working people in the, in the workforce. Have you ever walked in a place of business and the employ, employees seem like they don't care and they have a bad attitude? I think most of us probably don't appreciate that and we probably won't go back to that business will we and do business with them. Christian employees should do their jobs as if Jesus Christ were their supervisor. It's also my opinion that Christian bosses should be the most respected and beloved because of the instruction given uh, two verses later in Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you have a master in heaven. Christian bosses should be someone their employees, Christian or non-Christian, can count on to be just and approachable without the fear of being domineering or to be judgmental. The fourth area of influence is being level-headed. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, it says, But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. The King James ver Version uses the word discern instead of distinguish. The Greek word used here means to investigate or examine. In order to grow from infant Christians to mature Christians, we must learn discernment. We must train our conscience, our senses, our minds, and our body to distinguish good from evil. Can you recognize temptation before it traps you? Can you tell the difference between a correct use of Scripture and a mistaken one? Well, the idea here is to make sure you know the facts before jumping into the fight. It is very easy to get all excited about a perceived injustice or a wicked deed, but we need to show restraint and get the facts. Then we can respond, not react, and that response will more likely to be a godly one. Folks, we need to be level-headed about things. The enemy and the world does love to see Christians panicking about things that aren't true. Here we are just running around like chickens with their heads cut off, not bothering to go to the source and find out for certain. So we always need to get our facts first. The fifth area we'll be looking at concerning our influence for Christ is that of a healthy family. A family that is spiritually healthy, full of love and caring, speaks volumes to a world torn by divorce and abuse and other things. A healthy family takes work. It is not automatic that because you are a Christian, you will have a healthy marriage. In fact, the divorce rate among professing Christians has surpassed the divorce rate of the world, according to a recent study. 
I don't have the details in front of me as to the particular reasons. But you can guess that they are the same reasons as the world. And now it is more frequent than them. So why is this happening? Please listen as I read chap uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So the main reason, I think, is that husbands are not loving their wives like Christ loved the church. So what about the kids? Research shows that kids are raised that are uh, shows that kids who are raised in loving homes are better adjusted as adults. <coughs> By the way, loving doesn't mean giving them everything they want. It means giving them what they need. And sometimes that means discipline. On our last area of influence is prayer. We aren't going to spend a lot of time here, but let me read one last passage. This one from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 7. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. Prayer grounded in God's Word is powerful. What are some things to pray for? Well, we can pray for our elections. We can pray for our world problems. We can pray for our families. We can pray for the lost. We can pray for the Lord to return soon. We can pray for His will to be done. I know this has been a, a short lesson, but in conclusion, we have covered a lot of ground today, but we have certainly not exhausted the subject of influence. Rather, we have scratched the surface. I would like to think that in some way, every message you hear in this church deals with influencing our world for Christ. These five areas of influence are critical. So we shouldn't take them lightly. In a world floundering in sin and decay, Christians need to stand up and be recognized as people with a hope and a future. And until we pass from, from here through death or the rapture, we will live like it. So go out with an excitement that says, My God reigns. Even in the midst of all the problems here and abroad. And just watch what God does. Be people who live holy lives. Be prepared. Be people who treat others kindly. Even when they mistreat you. Work hard at whatever you do. Be level headed. Cultivate a strong family. And pray. And watch the God of heaven work in the lives of those you touch. Again, I mentioned that uh, this is kind of a short lesson, but I think it's a good lesson. It's a good example that Paul set for us to be an influence in our world. And uh, at this time, I would like to offer the invitation. If anyone has a need, uh, needs prayers of the church, or would like to become a Christian, uh, you may do so at this time as we stand and sing.